Uh, one of the things people have been asking me about uh, my three weeks being out under the cross and uh, praying for those that have been uh, driving by and for those that wanted to come up for me to pray for them. They said, uh, what have you learned? And I've learned quite a bit. Um, but there's one thing that I think God has taught me that uh, I needed, I already knew. Have y'all ever learned a lesson twice or three times or ten times? I mean, there's some things that we know, but yet... Um, if you asked me my head, I'd say, yeah, I know that. But if you looked at my life, I might not be doing everything that I'm supposed to be doing in those areas. Does that make sense? Uh, there are things that uh, I, I know that are true, but I'm not doing. The, how many of you know that there's, this is true, right? From Genesis to maps, it's all good, right? All of it's good. How many of it, are you living all of it? Me either. There's things I believe in here that I'm not living in my ordinary life, my, my daily life. There's some things that, that I guess that uh, I know, but yet I uh, have forgotten kind of along the way. If you're in your Bible in Acts chapter 5, I want to share with you one of those that the, the Lord kind of reminded me in my three weeks uh, out under the cross. In Acts chapter 5, it says in verse number 32, and we are his witnesses to, the, to these things. And that's speaking of, it's, this is Peter talking. And he's talking to, uh, he is Jesus' witnesses. He was a witness. He was with Jesus. He, he heard his teachings. He heard his preachings. <clears throat> he, he, saw, he, he knew that he was crucified on the cross of Calvary. And he was a witness of the resurrection. And he's telling the story of Jesus and that's why they're in there being persecuted in front of this group of the Pharisees. But he says, we are his witnesses, Jesus' witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Now that second phrase there, I knew, I do know, that the Holy Spirit bears witness of Jesus. And matter of fact, that's, that's what he does. He brags on God. He brags on Jesus. The, he, the Holy Spirit never talks about himself. I know that. But here's the things that I forgot, or I, I probably took for granted. I want to be a witness for Jesus. And I hope you do too. And, and that's what Peter is saying when he says, we are witnesses to these things. But he says, so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. I, I forgot that the Holy Spirit, I don't even have to ask the Holy Spirit to be out there working. He is. I don't have to ask him to be involved in people's lives. He is. And one of the things that, that uh, blessed me in the last three weeks is I have seen so much the, the Holy Spirit working in people's lives. I, when I first went out there, I said, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to say, Lord, let them look up here. Let them see our signs that say pray, and Lord, you just whisper to their heart. So what I was looking for was for them to see it, say pray, and in their spirit, the Holy Spirit say, you want to talk? Or the Holy Spirit would to bring up something that he, <laughs> excuse, excuse me, that he wanted to, to speak to them about. And my hope, my, my goal was, is that they would go on down the road and, and they would carry on a conversation maybe the rest of the day. Matter of fact, a lot of them have come up to me and told me that's exactly what happened. That, that over the days, and some of y'all have told me, I, I haunt for you every day or I pray for you every day and all those things. That I drive by and see you. Um, Jojo Thomas, who's a, our uh, associational missionary, he put something on Facebook. He was out there with me during the monsoon on Tuesday. And uh, he actually, he came during the, a lull in the storm. I don't know how they can figure that out. I never could find the lull in the storm until he showed up, but, but he was out there and he put it on Facebook and I think it got shared like 19 times and people were saying, well, I drove by and I saw that sign up there that said pray and that idiot that was underneath the cross. And I was like, well, I was the idiot, you know, I was the one. And, and so I, I, what I was noticing was God had been speaking to hearts all along and I forgot that. I want to be a witness for Christ. But really what I, what I want to do and what we all should do is join in the witness of the Holy Spirit that's already at work, wonderfully 
at work. You know, we have a tendency of doing things on our own, and we do a way of following what we think is right. Solomon, in the book of Proverbs, in chapter 14, verse 12, and in chapter, chapter 16, verse 25, he said the same exact verse verbatim twice. And it's become one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. And it goes like this. There is a way that seems right unto a man. And that's probably a proverb for all of us. There's a way that seems right to us, makes sense to us. We believe it. We live it. We follow it. I mean, it, it makes sense to us. And that's what we think and that's what we believe. But then he says, the end thereof are the ways of death. Now, really, what, what Solomon is saying is that there's some things in our life that we look at it and we believe it and we think that this is the way it is, but it's not the things of God. When you find the wisdom of man, you're still lacking. When you find, I mean, we may, we may totally believe it and, and we, wanna, we think that this is the way it should be, but that's nothing unless it's the ways of God. We do not need to follow simply the ways of man. But we're seeing it everywhere. All over the world today, you're seeing people doing things supposedly in the name of God that God's a million miles from. People killing people in the names of God. Denominations. I've had so many people come to me and one person said, uh, well, what denomination are you? And I'm like, well, we got a sign right there that says Baptist on it, you know, but they don't... They, so they, they'll tell me what denomination they are. and You know, denominations are man-made. And, and really, they'll take some part of some verse and, and they'll say, well, I, I know that's what it says, but we'll, we'll believe this and y'all believe that. And, and so people who come up at the cross and they're, they're trying to grill me for information and find out all these things. And, and I just talk to them and I share with them like I'm sharing with you. And they'll say, well, what do you think about this denomination? Or what do you think about this preacher? And there's one preacher, uh, he, his name comes up quite a lot. He's a very famous preacher in our, in our area. And I like him. I like him. And, I, and I, I said, well, there's one thing I don't like about him or one thing I wish he'd change. And he's a Pentecostal guy. And, and they immediately said, speaking in tongues. And I went, no, I, that's between him and the Lord, right? I'm not going to tell him how to do that or whatever. I may feel differently about it, but I, I, that's not what I have against him. And I, I told him what I had against him, and I'm not going to tell you all because he might be watching, right? You know, I don't, I don't want to create, because, see, listen, Satan always wants to divide and conquer. And the thing that, that about this guy, it has nothing to do with his preaching, and it has nothing to do with his character. He's got one of those little idiosyncrasies that I wish he'd quit, right? But, I mean, it, I have the same things. I, uh, we all have those things in our life, and those of you who don't think you have those things, ask your spouse, right? They'll tell you real quick, right? But I why is it that we have all these things that we allow Satan to divide us and pit one group against another? And all of it comes up where there is, there's a way that seems right to us. But we need to listen to the witness of the Holy Spirit. When I think about the Crusades, how many of y'all studied in school the Crusades? The things that were done under the name of God. I mean, a war for hundreds of years fighting over Jerusalem. And this group hated this group, and they were coming in under the banner of the cross. And I'm thinking, God's a million miles away from that. And the Jewish people, the, the, the church that Jesus came to when he was born into this world, the time frame of the Jewish people, this was supposed to be God's chosen people, and yet, they were a million miles. Well, not a million miles. They were a hundred miles away from the will of God. And here's the point. There were some things that God, through his Holy Spirit, was witnessing and doing, and they were not listening. As a matter of fact, they were fighting against those things. So I want to share with you today what I call the witness of the Holy Spirit in the world. So if you have your Bible in Acts chapter 5, let's look and see exactly what was going on there 
And I want to back up from the verse that I read just a moment ago. Let's, ver- let's start in verse number 29. Are you with me? I'm not going to make you stand up for all of the Word of God because we're going to cover parts of four chapters. Y'all say, oh me. All right. Let's look in verse number 29, Acts chapter 5. God, honor your word. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior. Now, they didn't like that, but that's exactly who Jesus is. To give repentance to Israel... They didn't want to repent. And forgiveness of sins. Matter of fact, you can't even have a relationship with God unless you come to God through Jesus Christ so that your sins can be forgiven. Then he goes on in verse 32 and says, And we are his witnesses to these things. So also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Then in verse 33 it says, When they heard this, they were furious and plotted, to kill him. Why in the world were they so mad that they wanted to kill him? Because these people were preaching Jesus and these Jewish people had just murdered Jesus. They had just crucified him on the cross. Remember the scripture I used last week? He said, you're trying to bring this person's blood and and put it on us. They didn't like that. They didn't want that. They didn't, like, they didn't want anything to do with Jesus Christ. Then one in the council, verse number 34, stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel. Gamaliel. He was one of the Pharisees. He was one of the leaders in the Pharisees. You may have heard of him before. He was a teacher in the synagogue. You may know his star student. He was called Saul. Later on, He would be called Paul. Galatians 1, Acts 23, it tells us that that Paul, when he was Saul, was, was a student of Gamaliel. He learned from him. He was from Tarsus. He was from a very rich family. But they had sent him to Jerusalem to synagogue school where he could learn the things of God And he was actually a student of Gamaliel. So look what it says here in verse number 34. Then one of the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people. And he commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. So he said, everybody knows him, everybody loves him. And and he says, guys, get these apostles out of here. I won't talk to you for a moment. So the room probably got the apostles out. Now let's hear what it was that Gamaliel said. Verse 35. He said to them, men of Israel, take heed to yourself. Be careful. Guys, y'all need to watch out. You need to, you're you're about to do something. You need to be very careful about what you're doing. Watch out. Be be very careful. You're going to do something you don't want to do here. He says, men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody. Don't you hate those guys that are always bragging on themselves? And and they're going to just put themselves out there. And by the way, there are plenty of preachers who do that. And they they want to draw a crowd. They really want to have a group of people follow them. I don't want you to follow me. I want you to follow my master. Right? The church is about Jesus. It's not about a preacher. Look what it says here. Uh, A number of Men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered, here's the words, and came to nothing. If you're following a man, he'll die, and all that will just come to nothing. If you're going to follow someone, don't follow a man, follow the Son of Man. You need to make, your, make sure your allegiance is not even in a church, it's in the God of the church. It's not about a denomination. It's about the Word of God. It's about listening. It's about worshiping God through Jesus Christ by the witness of the Holy Spirit in our life. He says, be very careful. Remember this guy, 
uh, Theodos, he was there, but he died and everybody left. Look what it says in verse 37. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census. Remember the time when Jesus was born and Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem because there was a tactation, there was a census that was being done? Most likely it's during that particular time. He says, and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. So he says, remember Theodos? He was there for a while. 400 followed him. He died. They scattered. Judas of Galilee, he had a following. He died. It came to nothing. Verse number 38. Now I say to you, keep away from these men. Remember what he said earlier? Take heed to yourself. Be careful. Watch out. Now he's saying, he says, um, keep away from these men. Let them alone. That's plain. It will, if, uh, excuse me, for if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. All those men that are getting a following, what happens to them after they die? A pastor in a church, and, and it's real big because they're, uh, of the pastor of the church, the pastor leaves, and what happens? Those that are just there for the pastor's sake, it just kind of goes away. It just drifts away. It becomes nothing. By the way, if he's a Jesus-preaching pastor, follow Jesus. You can trust him. And if he's a Jesus-preaching fat pastor, and you're following God and, and, and the Word of God in Jesus, then no matter the pastors, I, I've always said preachers are a dime a dozen. Amen? I can say it. I am one. Right? I mean, we're here today. I'm going to heaven one day. Right? If you, if you want to go to heaven, get your own ticket. You can't get there on my coattails. Right? Look, the pastor will go. But isn't it funny when the, those that are following the pastor, they'll go too. He says, if it's a, he said, it'll come to nothing. But if it's of God, look at verse 39. If it is of God, you cannot overthrow it. Lest you even be found to fight against God. Hold on. What was it Solomon said? There is a way that seems right unto a man. Seems reasonable. I think I'll do that. But the end thereof are the ways of death. But the ways of God through Jesus Christ are life, abundant life. That's what Jesus said. I come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Understand, if it's of God, if it's of man, it'll come to nothing. But if it's of God, you can't overthrow it, right? And be careful. What you think may actually be fighting against the things of God. One of the things that I've learned out under the cross is we need to hear the whisper of the Holy Spirit. We need to hear the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Our allegiance must be to one God, our Father, His Savior, our friend, our Redeemer, I tell everybody, people want to talk about the things of this world, and they want to talk about what's going on in the world, they want to talk about America, and they want to talk about the leaders of America, and I remind them, I remind them that we're supposed to pray for our leaders, right? And, and I, I want to pray for my leaders. I want them to be successful. I want the United States to be successful, but listen to me, I don't buy, bow to a president, I bow to a king, and I will follow him. Look. They can, they can do all those things in the name of man. I want to follow the will of God. It, because if I'm not listening to the Holy Spirit, if I'm not obeying the Holy Spirit, I may be doing my thing, but I'm not doing God's thing. I may, may do that which is reasonable to me, but I want to do that which is actual of God. So we, we're going to have to learn. Come on now, listen to me. We need to learn to be very instant and very obedient to the Spirit of Jesus in our life. So here is what they were. And 
So, what was the next thing that happened? Verse 40. They agreed with him. Amen. They're going to go home, right? No. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, didn't Gamaliel say, leave them alone? Well, they called them in and had them beaten. They commanded they should not go in the name of Jesus and let them go. So the apostles, verse 41, they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily, every day, in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. They told him, you better quit. And they're like, no, I don't believe so. Well, we'll beat you. Well, we'll re just rejoice in it that we were counted worthy to suffer shame for Christ. And the word of God began to spread. Look in chapter 6, verse number 7. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Now, here's a kicker. And a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Priest. I wonder even if those, uh, maybe some of the Pharisees or the Sadducees, maybe some of the ones who were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Now maybe they had seen the risen Lord. Maybe they were getting pricked in their heart by the preaching of the apostles. Maybe they wanted to believe. It says here, many, many. Praise God for that. Well, look what it Look what happens in chapter 6. We looked at this last week. There was a man by the name of Stephen. He was a deacon, but he was a preaching deacon. And he's preaching, and this same council gets together, and, and they're, they're bringing him in. Matter of fact, now they're trying to get some kind of lies built up against him. But I want you to hear this one unique thing. In, in chapter 6, look in verse 15. As this council is there, by the way, Gamaliel would have been a part of that. And Saul would have been a part of that. And Stephen is there. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, that is Stephen, saw his face as the face of an angel. When they look at him, the glory of God is so evident that it's like looking at the face of an angel that's been in the presence of God. This is the unbelievers. This is the counsel that, that in a little bit they're going to hear his sermon and they're going to get so mad at him, though he preached a magnificent sermon, that they take him out and, and stone him. But I, I said that to say this. Listen, as they're listening, they're not listening with open ears. They're not listening with an open heart. They're listening with a bias. There is a way that seems right unto a man. So as they're listening to Stephen, they're listening with ears that only want to hear certain things. Now, but when they looked at him, they could not deny the glory of God that was on him. Don't you think there's some working of the Holy Spirit in their hearts? Don't you think that they're probably starting to hear the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit saying, look at him. There's something different about this one. I see the, the presence of God on him. There's just an anointing of the Holy Spirit of God on such a one. That should be our desire. That when we get up every day, we can put on our clothes, but I pray that we'll be clothed with the Holy Spirit of God. We, it should be that when we go out and we speak to people in the day, that we do not give the wisdom only of man, but we can hear the Word of God and speak what the Holy Spirit of God says so that they can hear. John 5 said, I only speak, I only do what I see the Father doing. Wouldn't it be so wonderful if we would begin our day so clothed with Christ? Listen to me now as we walk our day so listening to the whisper, so open to his working in our life, so being used in all the circumstances that are around. Wouldn't it be wonderful if that's how God worked? Well, chapter 7, 
Stephen preaches this awesome sermon. And I want you to get, go down to verse number 54. You keep it up with me? Acts chapter 7, verse number 54. In verse 51 through 53, Stephen concludes his message by giving the invitation. Verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed at him with their teeth. Now, cut to the heart means that there is something that is intriguing. There is something that's penetrated their heart. Could it be the Holy Spirit of God is penetrating their heart? Now there's a decision that has to be made. There either has to be a yes or there's a no. You say yes to God and no to your will. Or you say yes to what you believe and what you think and no to the will of God. So they're, they're cut to their heart. And they gnash at him with their teeth. Now they're angry. Listen, if you say no to God, it's like a pendulum here. There's yes to God, no to God. If you say yes to God, glory will come. You say no to God, the ugliness will come out. Now they're gnashing at him with their teeth. Hmm. Verse 55, I, can't, I love this. But he being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. When they, then they cried out with a loud voice, verse 57, stopped their ears, ran at him with one accord, cast him out of the city and stoned him. Instead of hearing with an ear open, anger comes up within him. They, they take him out they throw him down, and they begin to grab rocks and throw at him, to hit him in the head, to hit him in the side. And they're throwing hard as they can. They're wanting to inflict. They're killing him. This is flat-out murder right here. But I want you to notice verse number 59, or verse 58. After it says, that, and they stoned him, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Gamaliel's student. The one that we would come to learn would be the Apostle Paul who would write half the New Testament. And here it says, they took off their cloaks and they laid it down at the feet of of Saul, so they'd have a better way to throw their stones at Stephen. Verse 60, then he that is Stephen knelt down, cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. I wonder what Saul was thinking. The one that they looked at earlier and saw the said that he had the face like the face of an angel. What a powerful sermon he preached in Acts 7. And now they, as they're stoning him, what words to come out? Don't charge these people with this sin. Does that not sound like Jesus? I wonder what was going on in Saul's heart when this was going on. Look in chapter 8, verse 1. Saul was consenting to his death. I don't know what was stirring there. We were, we'll talk about that more in just a moment. Whether he was maybe being pulled towards God, but he went back to his own way. You see, you've got to humble yourself to go to God. You've got to lower yourself and raise Him up. But if you... Lower God and raise up your thinking. You go against him. All that evil starts to come out. And now he's consenting to it. Look at the end of the rest of verse 1. Chapter 8, verse 1. Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. 
And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. So at the stoning of Stephen, now there, there, is, there is so much evil coming up that the, the Christians there are leaving Jerusalem and they're going in all the other places. And by the way, they're taking the gospel with them. But the apostles stay there in Jerusalem. Look in verse number 3. As for Saul, he made havoc. He was a wrecking ball for Satan. He was so filled with anger. He, he, had, he had this, we're going to talk about it in just a second. He had such a, a disturbance in his heart, a movement of God in his life. And instead of saying yes to Jesus, he was saying no. And now he is being used tremendously against the church. He made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Literally what he was doing was he was, he was taking them that, so that the same thing could happen to them that happened to Stephen. They would go before the council, they would be sentenced to death, and they would be stoned. Chapter 9, verse 1. Then Saul, still breathing threats, nothing's changed, Still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, he went to the high priest and asked letters from him, that is from the high priest, to the synagogue of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, that's what they called Christians, they were believers in the way, in the way of God. They were people of the way. Whether men or women, that's cold. He's not only trying to find men to kill, he's willing to murder women as well so that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone round him from heaven. Can I give you Brian's holy imagination? It's like Jesus said, hey, get the spotlight. The spotlight of the glory of God. See that guy right there? I want his attention. Don't you know he's got a spotlight? Probably not with sound effects like that. And, and it hits Saul. Look what it says. Suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground. Just right off of his animal that he was riding. And he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, God knew his name, knew who he was, Knew him before he was formed in his mama's womb. He knew every hair on his head. He knew every thought in his heart. He knew what he was thinking about that morning. He knew what he was thinking about right now. And the call of God is always personal. I may preach a message and preach it to all of you, all of you that are in the building, all that are watching it online. I may preach a message for all to hear, but when the message comes from God, it comes from His voice to your heart, through your ear. He'll whisper to you directly. He knows you by name. Saul, why are you persecuting me? Not only did he know who he was, but he knew what he was doing. Saul said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus. wonder what was going through his mind now. Do you think he had one of those, oh, no. You ever been wrong? That would have been a great amen moment, too. Any, try it again. Anybody ever been wrong? Oh, I got a few no's and a few yeses. And we'll give an invitation, Mark. And, and when, you, when you know that you're wrong and you know that you're caught and you're going, oh, no, he said, when he heard, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, there's the next sentence here in the King James and the New King James authorized version. It's a part of, the, of those. It, it, it's a part of the original manuscripts that we have. It's in the original Greek and the Hebrew. But some of the translations that we have today, when they found other manuscripts 
that ha- of the New Testament. This one sentence wasn't a part of all of them. So these scholars said, well, because it's not in all the manuscripts, we're just going to take it and just remove it as if it's not there at all. Be very careful to add to or take away from the Word of God. Because I think this sentence explains it all. Here's the sentence. He said to him, Saul, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Listen to me now. It is hard for you to kick against the goads or to kick against the pricks. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. In that day, they would have oxen. And the oxen would lead a cart or a wagon. And they would, uh, that would be their, their motor to take them up and down the road. And those oxen may not want to move. So you would have something to prick or to goad the oxygen. Did I say oxygen? Let's try that again. To prick or goad the ox to make it want to go on down the road. All right? So you're, you're back there, and you're saying, let's go. And it wants to just stay there. You, you poke it real good, and it'll say, all right, all right, I'm going, I'm going, and it'll start down the road. But if you're standing behind it, guess what that ox may do? It might kick you. Anybody ever been behind a, a donkey? Anybody ever heard the phrase, don't to walk behind a donkey? Uh, what might happen if you're trying to get that donkey to do something, and, and you're behind it? Yeah, it might get your attention. You're trying to get its attention. It might get yours. It might kick you real well. So listen now. When you're, pr- when you're, when you're trying to goad something, but the opposite of it is you're kicking against the pricks. You're kicking against. You're fighting against the goad. The Holy Spirit is coming and pricking your heart. The Holy Spirit is coming and whispering again and again and again. And, and you're fighting against that. God in love is speaking. And you're doing everything you can to not listen. In love, he's calling you to himself. He's calling you to heaven. He's calling you to joy. He's calling you to peace. But your pride may be calling you to what you want and your way and your thinking and and your life. And you start thinking of, yeah, okay, but if I surrender to God, what will others think? If I surrender to God, I'll have to change. If I give my heart to God, He may may ask me to do something I don't want to do. And that battle is happening. How many of you who have trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord remember that battle? I wish the first time the Holy Spirit whispered my name, I had said yes. But it was months. And nobody else, well, I I say nobody else. Yeah, there were people around me who could see what was happening. They could see that battle. I remember the day before I got saved, it was all over me. My dad did something he had never done before. He asked me if I wanted to go with him. He was going into work on Saturday morning. And I went and rode with him to work. And we actually had a conversation. And, and, and in that, during that conversation, he told me some things, helped me with some things that opened the door. And the next day, Sunday, that Sunday night, actually, I gave my heart and life to Christ. He, he is saying to Saul how hard it is for you in this battle of being obedient. Listen to verse 6. So he that is Saul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what would you have me to do? What an amazing, glorious sentence. To hear God, to listen to the whisper. Okay, God, what is it you want me to do? God knows how to get our attention. There's an easy way. And there's a hard way. I told you just a second ago about when I was 10 years old and God was speaking to my heart. He had been for many weeks. I had had friends that gotten saved. And I was fighting it hard. But it came to a place that I can only explain it for me. All right, I can't tell you 
It, it, God works differently in every heart. But for me, I thought I was going to explode. I felt like my, I had a 1,000 pounds on my, on my shoulders, and I felt like if I didn't do something, I was going to burst. And I took one step for God, and he's taken every step for me ever since then. I came and I gave him my sins, and he gave me his glory. I gave him all my ugliness, and he gave me his beauty. I gave him my death, and he gave me his life. What a glorious thing to say, Lord, what would you have me to do? Then that gauge comes up in your life. Will you say yes to him? Or will you say no? Matter of fact, for Saul, God blinded him. He said, go to Damascus. There will be one there who will show you the way. Ananias. So his friends had to lead him. This prideful man couldn't even follow his own. He couldn't even find his way for himself. But when he got there and he talked to Ananias, the scales fell from his eyes. And God changed his heart. Even then, he had that walk to Damascus. They were close, but the walk of wondering in his heart. I wonder what God is saying to you. If you're not a Christian, the very first thing that he's going to do is he's going to present, he's going to show you your sins, and he's going to bring to you Jesus. And he's going to say, Jesus died on the cross of Calvary to save you from your sins. But if you want to follow your own way, if you want to do things your own way, it's up to you. You can take your sins, though, and have them forgiven. You can give, them, you can give your, your death life to Jesus, and he'll give you eternal life. He'll give you life and give it to you abundantly. You can give him your ugliness, and he'll give you his beauty. But if you do know Jesus, he is your Lord and Savior. He may be saying to you, why don't we walk together? Why don't you listen to my whisper? Church, listen to your pastor real quick and I close. What we need more than anything else in this very troublesome time is not more words from the press, not more words from the news, not what everybody says on Facebook or on Instagram, definitely not TikTok. We don't need what social media has. We don't need what the neighbors say. Well, Mama always said or Daddy always said, what we need is to be obedient to the whisper of the Holy Spirit in our lives as He leads us. We need to Wake up every morning and be clothed with the Holy Spirit of God. We need to pray to God, have a conversation with God. We need to open up and listen to what it is that He may be saying. Whatever He wants to do in our hearts and our lives. When you've got a question, hear Him. Hear Him. When someone does something ugly, listen to Him. Be obedient to Him. I wonder what would happen. I know what would happen. Revival would happen. Instead of putting on the fragrance of the world and the look of this world, what if we started to fully seek the Lord with all of our heart? Oh, what God could do. What if we started to be just absolutely, openly obedient in all things, in every area of our life? Instead of limiting what we give to God, yield all of our hearts to Him. I wonder what God would do. Would God bring change? Would God speak life? 